Good morning on this wonderful Wednesday. This is Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. And it is October the 14th, right? <laughs> I'm so glad. We're reading um, Jeremiah chapters 23 and 25. Um, and I, I'll tell you what, I, I got a message from the Lord this morning for myself. I got a message this morning that I knew I was supposed to talk about. And then we come to the table and we've had some events around here in our um, communities that has impacted us. And I got a whole brand new message about it, you know, that's relevant to that. I just love when God does that for us. Just, oh my goodness. Hi, Judy. How are you this morning? And Karen, good to see you guys. Debbie Nolan's on with us. And then my top fan, Carrie Steinke. Isn't that something, that little banner top fan? Thank you, sister. And then Caroline, how are you? Um, how is Connie doing? Good to see you guys. There's our hugs from Eileen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Getting ready to um, converge starting tomorrow for our Dream Big Retreat. There will be a few ladies coming. In fact, our first one will be coming in, will be flying in this evening. Um, uh, Carrie, Louise, I may um, FaceTime you if you've not got to meet um, Kat yet, uh, Catherine, I may FaceTime with you. Um, we'll just see how it goes. But, but anyway, um, Catherine's gonna be coming in this evening, flying in. And then um, others will be arriving tomorrow, and there'll be a few of us that'll gather together uh, in advance of the retreat to pray and to fellowship together on Thursday at Canyon Crossings outside of Canyon Crossing, outside of Sand Springs, Oklahoma. And then the actual retreat starts Friday evening, so it's going to be a powerful time. I know that I know, and um, there's a teaching that's going on that started on Monday of this week called How to Prepare Your Heart. It's Andrew Womack, and you can go to awmi.net, Andrew Womack Ministries website, and just click on the daily, uh, the de today's teaching, I think is what it's called. <clears throat> and, uh, listen, and listen in, and I recommend you go back to Monday, and especially if you're coming to our retreat, I'm telling you, it's not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that this week, starting Monday, the week of our fall retreat, that that teaching is how to prepare your heart. And so I've put the word out um, to our Dream Big Girls and hope that y'all will do that. And then today, I mean, the, the teaching today. So Jeremiah, first of all, starts off in chapter 23, blasting the prophets that are not doing what God called them to do and not saying the things they're supposed to be saying. And um, and then it goes on once again, and remember, he's telling them that, the, that they're going to, to be captured by the Babylonians, that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to get his army and he's going to come into um, the Israelites and he's going to capture them and he's going to take them away from their homes. I mean, just imagine, you know, sitting in your home and every window is broken and every door is broke down and in come the soldiers and they grab you and put you in chains and they don't just take you from your home. They don't just take you outside of your little town or your city. They don't just take you out of state. They take you to a whole nother country and they put you into slavery and into bondage and they mistreat you and they beat you and they do horrible things to you. He is prophesying that that's what's going to happen for 70 years. And this is old covenant folks. God is forewarning them that God is going to make this happen. You understand that? God's chosen people, his people, have been so horrible that they were sacrificing their own children to, to the idol Baal, among many, many other things. I mean, literally, it, you name the sin and they're doing it. And so... God's angry and he hates sin and he has told them and warned them and more and given them chance after chance after chance. 
and they continue. In fact, they get arrogant and they they scoff at Jeremiah. They they beat him because they don't even want him giving them the warnings. They put him in jail. That's how rebellious these people are. And um, so this is what's getting ready to happen. And God's speaking through Jeremiah. Now, remember, this is Old Covenant. Jesus, when he came and they nailed him to the cross, he took all of God's anger. So all of the anger that we're seeing in this Old Testament reading was placed upon Jesus Christ so that we never feel feel or have to fear God's wrath to the extent at, we don't have to fear God's wrath at all, but certainly never to the extent of what we are been, we've been reading about all this time. Now, there are those um, that believe that God will do bad things to us. There are those that believe that God, because of Jesus, has spent all of his anger and therefore will not punish us and will not put us through bad things. There are those that believe that today, after Jesus Christ, so we're in the year 2020, and our whole, our whole calendar system is set up before Christ and after death um, with the timelines. Um, there are those that believe that um, um, that you have to suffer, that God will put things on you, that he'll continue to things. There's those that believe that Jesus took all of that and that, that the bad things that happen happen as a result of the fallen world in which we live in. And there's a thousand variations of everything I just said, a thousand variations. There is one truth, one truth. And the thing is, is I'm quite convinced that as long as we have these carnal bodies, that, that we continue and we progressively learn more and more truth. We, we learn by hearing, because I believe that God is speaking to all of us all the time, and he is speaking nothing but truth to us. And then he confirms what he's speaking to us through his word. And I believe that revelation and transformation is progressive that the longer we seek him and the longer we abide in him, the more that is revealed to us and the more truth is revealed to us. I believe differently today based on my oneness with my father and the amount of time I spend with him, the amount of time I spend reading, the amount of time I spend praying, the amount of time I spend listening. And I have different beliefs than I did five years ago, 10 years ago, and way different than I did 20 and 25 years ago when I spent about 15 years of my adult life believing that God was mad at me. I believed a lie that he was mad at me. So I'm continually learning more. More is being revealed to me. I'm understanding better and better. But how cool is it that in today's reading, when God is telling them, he is punishing them for their sins, that in the same breath almost, it's in chapter 24, verse 6, he says this, I will watch over and care for them. So he, he, he starts off in chapter 24 talking about the figs um, and that there's a basket of good figs and there's a, pas a basket of bad figs. So once again, he's using symbolism. He's using something in the physical to represent something in the spiritual. Another term that is oftentimes used is type and shadow. Um, by using a basket of bad figs and a basket of good figs. And so as we start reading in chapter, chapter 24, verse 6, he's speaking about the basket of good figs and that it represents his chosen people that God himself ordered to be captured and put into slavery, exiled to another country, and it's going to be a period of 70 years now, the Israelites was in bondage and in slavery in Egypt 400 years. Now, they are going to be, the, the ones we're reading about today is going to be uh, in slavery and in bondage and exiled for 70 years. But this is what I want you to hear, is that he's punishing them all. 
They've all sinned, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The law was given to point out what sin is and to show us that we can never in and of ourselves ever, ever um, be good enough to um, we can never, ever, ever be good enough to never, ever break the law. That that we all fall short. See, God created this carnal body. He knew. He knew. He knew when he created us the decision that Adam and Eve would make in the garden. He, he knows the beginning from the end. There's nothing hidden from him. He knew. If there was never any evil, how would we ever know what good is? If sin didn't rage at times, why would we ever need a God? I mean, th this gets so deep. So here we are talking about, reading about the good basket of figs, which represents his people being the good ones that are in exile. So yeah, they sinned, but they are still, in God's eyes, considered the good ones. Um, uh, let's go back to verse 3. Then the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, what do you see? I replied, figs, some very good and some very bad, too rotten to eat. Then the Lord gave me this message. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The good figs represent the exiles I sent from Judah to the land of Babylonians. I, and here it is. This, is. this is the whole thing today. I will watch over and care for them, and I will bring them back here again. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them hearts that recognize me as the Lord. They will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me wholeheartedly. So, see, the physical eyes would look on that situation and see these people that their doors were broken down. They came in, they arrested them, they put chains on them, they exiled them off to another country. And everything they knew as a way of life was destroyed right in front of them. And they're now into slavery. And physical eyes would look on that and just think, oh, that's horrible. How could God do such a thing? And then we, you know, it just, just imagine with me that you're looking out across the land and you see the Israelites in bondage and you see over here, oh, they're beating them with chains over here. And over here, these people are starving because they're withholding food. The captors are withholding food from them because they're not working hard enough. And over here, you see, are you with me in your imagination? And, and so physical eyes, we look on that and all we see is the bad. Oh, it's awful. Even even when we know that it's a result of their own sins, that they brought it on themselves, you look on that and you think, how can they survive that? How can they get over that? But right here, see, it's written. God reveals his heart and he says, I know, Jeremiah, that there's my good ones in that basket. And this is what I want you to know. With spiritual ears and spiritual Eyes, this is what I want you to see that I'm doing. I'm. You can only see this, Jeremiah, with physical ears, I mean, with spiritual ears, with spiritual eyes. I'm watching over them. Well, see, we live by faith, not by sight. What looks as though is horrible, God is saying, oh, I, I, I got them. There's a song that says, this one's with me. God is saying, that one's mine, and that one's mine. I watch over them, and I'm caring for them. It may look like they're starving. I am sustaining them. I am giving them grace. When those beatings are taking place, they're not even feeling it because my grace is more powerful than those beatings. And then I will bring them back home again. I will bring them back, <clears throat> and I'll build them up, and I'll not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them, I will give them 
hearts that recognize me as the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. So what is the situation going on that you're seeing with physical eyes? And you're going, oh, this breaks my heart. Oh my gosh, this is so bad. I can't see any good in this. I can't see any good in this. I don't know how that little girl's going to be able to cope. I don't know how that little, I don't know how that one's going to be. I, I'm telling you, this is our word for today. When we're his, when we're his, and when, when we are young and innocent, we're his. Just because it looks like all hell is broken loose <laughs> doesn't change my God. Not one little bit. Even though, see, we're, we're new covenant saints. We are the righteousness of Christ. We get to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He took care of the rebellious, sinful. I mean, they scoffed at him. They... they when they beat Jeremiah, they might as well have been beating Jesus Christ. I mean, what they did represented what they did to Jesus Christ. Do you see the type and shadow of that? And yet God still says, but I will care for them. I will watch over them. So even though it doesn't look as though the worst sickness is happening, the worst disability is on this child, and you don't know how in the world. This child is in an institution. This child has nobody that calls and checks on him. This child has severe disabilities that causes him to, to it looks as though he's in constant torment all the time. And these words are whispered into my heart and says, but, but Elizabeth, my grace is sufficient. Elizabeth, you can you not see that that child is mine in a way that you'll never experience on earth, Elizabeth? Do you not see? See spiritually. Do you not see, Elizabeth? Things are not as they seem in the physical, Elizabeth. And man, that'll comfort you. That's where our faith comes into play. And you say, oh, it, we can't have faith like that. Really? You're going to tell me you can't have faith like that? We can believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. How much faith does that take? I mean, just let your teenage girl come home and say, Well, Mom, I'm pregnant, but I've never known a man. And yet, you, you know, at least here in America, at least in the those of us that's been brought up, with the name of Jesus on our lips. We don't even question that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. That's called faith. See, see, the salvation was already there. It's not that we woke up one day and said, okay, I want to get saved and we're safe. Salvation was already there. It's that Ephesians chapter 3 tells us that we're saved by grace, which is what God did for us without us doing a thing, through faith. Leave out the faith part, and if I don't believe I'm saved, I'm not saved, and I'll live a life of hell. But the salvation comes when, by faith, we accept what's already been done for us. See, every single time a sinner gets saved, Jesus doesn't have to get born again, be raised up through age 33, and get crucified again on the cross. That's already been done. It's already done. Salvation is ours. It is here, but if we don't choose to believe, we'll never experience that salvation. <laughs> mm, just powerful, powerful today. Um, and then th there was so much good. Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about, um, how does he call it? It um, um, Clarify some things talking about the world don't be fooled by what they say for that day will not come until there is a grand rebellion uh, the man of lawlessness that's what i wanted to talk about um 
uh, so verse 3, Thessal 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. <coughs> Another way of saying the enemy, and the one who brings destruction, he will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temples of God, claiming that he himself is God. Uh, it, it goes on and really it, it talks about and points out that there's really three things that's holding this man of lawlessness back um, right now today anyway. And it's interesting that the first thing that holds him back is our government. See, once again, we see our government as the man of lawlessness. We see our govern govern government as, as the evil. And yet, stop and think about it. Without any form of government, and I don't care what country you're in, and no boundaries and no laws, and the evil is left unchecked, I mean, just think about what it would be like on our highways without speed limits. Think what it would be like if we didn't have laws against pedophiles. What would it be like if we didn't have laws against murder? Against what, what would our world be like without laws against illegal drugs? You think we've got chaos now. Can you see how the government is actually holding back the man of lawlessness? And then number two, what holds it back is our church. I mean, we had a conversation the other day. I don't remember who it was about, what it was about. It's not intended for anybody that's listening. To, and I don't think it's about anybody with the sound of my voice. But Tom and I was talking about a couple of children that are struggling and, and we just said, you know, golly, we wish we could take the knowledge we've got from here that's gone to here, because I only want the knowledge that comes from my spirit man. The mind of Christ is here, and he puts it into my mind, and that says, get those kids in church. Get them in church. They're struggling. They're, they're, they're rebelling. They're yelling against their parents. They're saying mean, hateful things against their parents and, and they're struggling in school and they're being rebellious, rebellious in school. And the conversation just simply was, man, do you know how much help it would be if they'd be in Sunday school and in vacation Bible school and they'd be around what's holding the man of law, lawlessness at bay? And then the third thing that holds the man of lawlessness at bay to keep him from taken over the earth is the Holy Spirit in us. You know, you've heard me say it over and over again. Early, in the early days of COVID-19, when in America we heard it, one of the first things God whispered to me was to rise up and fight that virus. Don't give in to the panic, to the fear. Don't give in to the virus. That's the Holy Spirit in us. So, and then I want to get to the Psalms. Can you tell I'm so excited about today's reading? It's just <clears throat> Psalms 84. Good stuff in here if I can find it. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, verse 5, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. Do you not see how that fits what we're talking about? It looks as though our government is horrible, and yet our government is one of the things that's holding back the man of lawlessness. It looks as though we're walking through the valley of weeping, but it will become a place of refreshing springs. So even in our grieving and our mourning, what looks like the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. It looked horrible. God was punishing his people and he was sending them into exile, into slavery and bondage, into a foreign land. But what resulted of it is I will bring them back, he said. I will build them up and not tear them down and they will know that I am their God and they will be my people. 
This all just matches. <laughs> mm. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God. O oh Lord God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, look with favor upon them, uh, upon the king, our shield. Show favor to the one you have anointed. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. You think God doesn't want us to go to church? It is written. It is written. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Oh yeah, he wants us to go to church. No two ways about it. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Don't tell me that God won't prosper you when you choose him. He will withhold no good thing. Is he going to rain down million dollar bills for me today? Well, you know, that would on the surface seem like that's a very good thing, right? Oh, all I got to do is reach up and grab them and I can have as many millions as I can reach up and grab. Here's the truth is I wouldn't know how to handle that kind of money for anything right now. Not today in my present sense. So therefore that is not a good thing. See, God knows what's good for me way better than I know what's good for me. But the truth is, this is what I believe. I walk in God's favor. I take God's favor with me everywhere I go. Tom and I go into restaurants and we'll go into a restaurant over and over and over and over again. It'll be empty and it'll be completely full by the time we leave because we bring God's favor with us everywhere we go. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. When I believe that I am blessed, I live my life like I'm blessed. If I believe that I'm doomed and gloomed and everything bad's going to happen, everything bad starts happening. We attract the energy of what we send out. That is just the law of the way it works. God withholds no good thing from me. That means right now, this moment, I have everything I need. This, it's scriptures like this that allows me with confidence and boldness to proclaim that right now, this very second, everything is as it should be. Everything is as it should be. Not because everything's perfect. I mean, they were still in exile. But while they were in exile, God was watching over them and he was caring. Who do you want to watch over you? Who do you want to have care for you? The man of lawlessness? I set before you this day, life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. I'm blessed. Are you blessed? Tomorrow's thankful Thursday. Can you spend all day long tomorrow? Why don't, why don't we just start today with everything we're grateful for? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God, the Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O oh Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. And speaking of trusting in you, let's end with the Proverbs. My daddy called me this morning and read the Proverbs to me. 2515, patience can persuade a prince. Patience can persuade a prince and a soft speech can break bones. If you, I, I could probably preach on both of those statements for another hour. Patience. Speaking of trust in God, patience can persuade us prince, and soft speech can break bones. How are we doing on our grumbling and complaining for the month of October? Hmm. <laughs> I love you guys. Have a wonderful Wednesday.